we're trying to accomplish. There are various reasons for pursuing this kind of project. It has tremendous technological spin-offs. I mean, this is the largest cryogenic, the, the Large Hadron Collider is the largest producer of liquid helium, the largest online computing facility, and so on and so on. You learn a lot about technology, the way people talk about learning technological things by going into space. You would learn even more by doing this sort of thing. Um, there's also an intellectual spin-off. Lots of people who are interested in this sort of thing in high school tend toward physics and math. They may not wind up as elementary particle physicists. I hope not. I mean, we have enough competition. But they, they go into other areas of science and engineering. They form, and the particle physicists themselves form a valuable cadre. You know, the, the scientists in World War II who developed nuclear weapons and high frequency radar and other things that were really important in winning the war were not people who had worked on military technology before the war. They were people who had worked on fundamental physics. But they were there and available when they were needed. But the real motivation, the thing that at least motivates us, is that we're building a coherent theory of nature. It's something that's been going on, well, I mentioned Aristotle, certainly at least since then. It's something I think of which our civilization can be especially proud. And it really has to continue. Thank you. That was fantastic, wasn't it? You know, there is no response from you guys here. So, uh, you know, we, the Linear Collider Workshop of, uh, of the world, you know, international you know, workshop for, what is that called? Future Linear Colliders, that's right. And would like to thank you uh, for giving you some of these um, memento, I must say. So here is, uh, here is one. With deepest appreciation to Professor Steven Weinberg for your memorable public lecture at LCWS 12 conference, University of Texas at Yeah, Arlington. but how did you know it was going to be memorable? <laughs> I already knew. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then we have decided to make you a volunteer for this conference. So here is, uh, here is our volunteer t-shirt. There you go. Thank you very much. There is one more. This is a specially made uh, laser pointer for, uh, for LCWS 12. You know, you guys were going to use this in your parallel session. And uh, we'd like to give one of these to you so that you can use it in your talks and remember LCWS 12. I will never forget. Thank you very much. Let's give him another big applause. Thanks. Now, um, I have to give you some instructions, okay? So there will be two microphones in the center aisle. Um, and you can line up to ask questions, and uh, Professor Weinberg will select, you know, evenly left and right in a symmetric fashion, and he might break symmetry at some point, yeah? Okay, now you can start lining up if you have questions. Can you give us some predictions for ideas beyond the standard model? Oh boy. Uh, well, we've been looking at that for a long time. Um, and it's clear that among the things beyond the standard model is dark matter. Astronomers tell us five-sixths of the mass of the universe is a kind of particle which is n not any of the particles described in the standard model. And uh, we don't know what it is. It may be a particle that can be produced at the Large Hadron Collider, and it may not be. And uh, there are lots of theories about it. Unfortunately, the astronomers can only tell us the total mass of these particles in space. 
We don't know how many there are, so we don't know their individual mass. So we don't know how hard it is to create them individually. There are experiments going on to look for products when these particles annihilate with each other. Uh, they have to be fairly stable to have lasted this long in the history of the universe, but the idea is that they can annihilate with each other, and people are looking for the, de the annihilation products. And also, uh, other experimentalists are looking for actual examples of these particles coming into our laboratories and hitting atoms in a detector, which then recoil and produce a flash of light or a track or something. And uh, some, peop some experimentalists think they've found them, others think they haven't. There's no question there's something beyond the standard model. And of course, another thing beyond the standard model, which I've mentioned several times, is gravitation. It doesn't fit in well into the relativistic quantum field theory that we use in the standard model. And, um, well, a lot of, I have ideas about what could be done about that, but they're not very good ideas. Um, there, is, I mean, there is a class of theories called string theory which attempt to unify gravitation with the rest of physics and are extraordinarily attractive mathematically, but so far have led to no predictions that can be verified. Uh, now, that's a tour of the horizon. Is there another question? Uh, none over here, but there's one there. Um, I actually had a question that you were uh, just actually um, sort of mentioning. Uh, currently, the Higgs-like particle, if I was at least told by the internet, debated to either be spin zero or spin two, and if it were a spin two, it would be a graviton. Um, well, it could have any even spin. We don't. It could be, it doesn't have to be two, it could be four or six. Okay, so if you could uh, expound a little bit more on wh what would happen to the standard model if it were a graviton, or? I, I don't know how to uh, think about that. I mean, it's not the graviton, which is a massless particle. This particle is not massless. It's like the graviton, in the only in the sense that it has spin two. Um, it doesn't have the peculiar I mean, gravitons, which make up the gravitational field, have the peculiar property that, that the gravitational mass, the mass that determines how strongly particles feel gravitational fields, is the same as the inertial mass, which is a measure of how much of a kick you have to give a particle to get it moving. Um, that's a statement about how the gravitational field interacts with matter. This particle doesn't obey any such simple rule. And I think it's just, you know, it might have spin two, but it ain't a graviton. And, and it doesn't, I don't, we don't have any good, good theory for such a massive spin two particle. It would be something, it would be amazing that it interacts as strongly as it does, I would say. Even though it interacts very weakly, uh, a spin two particle has, would have interactions that are suppressed by powers of some very large mass. We don't know the details, but we would expect such a particle would interact very, very weakly, just as the graviton does. The, the graviton interacts so weakly with ordinary matter that no one has ever detected any effect of the gravitational force between particles in an atom, say. And no one ever will. It's just incredibly weak. Um, so this particle, you would think, would, if, if it has spin two, would in, interact very, very weakly, much more weakly than the one that's observed. I'll bet it spins zero. <laughs> yeah. Is there a compelling reason to think that we should have a solution to the dark matter as a particle? Oh. Or that particle, that it should be in the realm of elementary particles? Well, elementary, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, okay, elementary. But, but a bad. particle, yes, particle. because it behaves like a particle in the sense that it, it forms clusters. 
just the way a particle traveling at a speed much less than the speed of light would behave. Uh, I mean, this, we know these particles are moving very slowly, so it's not some kind of thing like a field of force. This is, this is something uh, which is moving slowly enough so that it be, can be caught under the influence of its own gravity and form the halos which give rise to galaxies. I mean, our own galaxy is surrounded by a halo of dark matter particles, which we know about because if the halo wasn't there, the, at the rate the galaxy is spinning, it would have fallen apart long ago. It's the dark matter particles that provide the gravitation that holds the galaxy together. But the, the halo itself wouldn't hold together unless these were slowly moving particles. Well, I, I can't prove that they're particles, but that's what seems to fit everything we know about them. I should ask about a question over here. Uh, what new information uh, would be able be able to get from a linear collider that uh, you wouldn't be able to get from the the, uh, the circular? Well, just much more precise information. Um, you know, I said that the um, the rate at which certain decay channels, like the fo two photon decay, is produced, is within a factor of two of what you theoretically expect. Part of that uncertainty is experimental, and that will gradually improve. But part of it is theoretical, because the Higgs is produced, in the, as I said, in the collision of hadrons, which are very complicated. With the uh, electron-positron collider, you'll be able to make uh, really exquisite measurements of the way that these decay. It, it'll just be a, a high accuracy machine uh, rather than something producing some new kind of particle. Of course, it may produce new particles also. And there are various arguments about what the energy of this should be. And the higher the energy, the more likely it'll be that it'll produce new particles. But at the very least, as Peskin argues, um, it will allow pre precision measurements of the properties of the Higgs particle. It'll pin down the spin and the decay modes and so on. And we'll then see whether or not, not only that it is the standard model Higgs particle, but whether there's something else beyond the standard model that's producing small deviations. Um, when, bu when building this linear collider, um, as you mentioned earlier, um, as compared to um, building a space program for NASA or something, would you say the cost is there? I understand that there's a lot of, there needs to be a lot of collaboration between. Well, there's, there's no comparison between the cost of these accelerators and the cost of the space uh, ventures. Uh, I mean, I, this really hurts. Um, when the super collider was canceled, it was coming up for a final vote at the same time as the International Space Station. And the International Space Station passed and the super collider was canceled. The International Space Station has cost 10 times what the super collider would have cost, something like 100 billion rather than 10 billion. And it has produced nothing of scientific value. It may now, actually, because there's an experiment that has been sent up to study cosmic rays on the International Space Station, but it, that actually could have been sent up as an unmanned satellite. The astronauts play no role in the, um, in the experiment, and they never have played any role in science. Um, <laughs> Uh, not everyone agrees. <laughs> the, uh, s but, and when you talk about going to the moon and Mars, the program that uh, former President Bush outlined, that wouldn't have cost a hundred billion, that would have cost more like a trillion dollars. So th this, they're just orders of magnitude different. I mean, ten billion dollars is a lot of money, and um, 
you know, it's not, it's not a lot of money compared to the whole federal budget, but it's a, to me it seems like a lot of money. Uh, but it's just, it pales in comparison with uh, space programs. Okay, I'm an aspiring engineer and I'd like to know, with what we know now, are there any practical implications of the Higgs-like particle or...? In the, no, in the near term, anything I can anticipate, no. I don't think it's going to have any value in medicine or technology. What has value, apart from the spin-offs, which I mentioned earlier, is that when you build a coherent view of nature, you get a power over nature, which then gives you capabilities that you never dreamed of. And an example I've used before is uh, at the turn of the century, physicists were studying the flow of electricity through near vacuums in glass tubes. And by studying the way that the electric currents bent when you applied electric and magnetic fields, J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. A large part of modern technology is based on our knowledge of the existence of the electron. If we didn't know that, we'd be nowhere. I mean, just think of the word, electronics. It wouldn't exist. Um, if that question had been asked in 1890 uh, and said, what is the practical, what are you going to learn from this? No one would have been able to anticipate anything like that. And um, you might have argued what people should be spending their time on are improving steam boilers. But I, I really believe, although I can't imagine how the Higgs boson itself is going to be used for anything, I do think that having a successful, unified, theory that encompasses a very large part of what we know about nature uh, is going to give human beings capabilities that will, in the end, uh, provide occupation for engineers, too. Over here. Yeah, I'm, I'm a practicing engineer. That question was very similar to what I was about to ask. I, I was going to ask you if you dare to make any predictions on the biggest areas of practical application as we advance our theory towards some kind of uh, unified no. Uh, theory. No. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Over here. Uh, thank you. For, uh, I'm also an engineer, but I'm completely disinterested in any type of practical application. I was wondering, uh, since the scientific community awaited for 45 years for the experimental um, confirmation of the theories from the 60s and 70s, could you give any type of prediction how long will uh, we have to wait for the, any experimental prediction of the models that go beyond the standard models, such as supersymmetries? Uh, I have you. no idea, because I, those models are not uh, precise about the masses of the new particles, so we don't know what energy we have to get up to to discover signs of supersymmetry. Uh, I wish I could answer that, but I, I really can't. Um, but we already do know of some things that go beyond the standard model. Uh, one thing is gravity, as I said, we've known about that for a long time, but there's also the neutrino mass. I, I kind of waffled on that and said, well, the neutrino is essentially massless. In the standard model, the neutrino is massless. It's been discovered uh, first by studying neutrinos from the sun, but then in terrestrial experiments. The neutrinos actually have a tiny mass of the order of a millionth the mass of the electron, vastly less than any of the other particles of the standard model, except for photons, which are really massless. And uh, this is something that we think comes from a world of physics that's at energies way higher than the standard model. Roughly speaking, the mass of the neutrino, you would guess, would be something like the square of the mass of the Higgs particle divided by whatever fundamental energy scale represents the, the new physics. Well, that means that fundamental energy scale that 
represents new physics. In order to give a mass of a neutrino like a millionth of an electron mass, it has to be somewhere like a million, million, million electron volts. I mean, vast, no, a, 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 excuse me, a million, 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 billion electron volts. I mean, very, very high. <laughs> and um, that's our first, aside from gravity, that's our first glimpse of a new world of physics at energies that we can't hope to reach uh, in accelerators, but that we may learn about through theories that make other predictions that can be tested in accelerators. And uh, so, you know, we already know there's things beyond the standard model. It's just, there are very few. I mean, we wouldn't know about gravity if it weren't for the accident that it adds up, that every particle in the Earth is pulling us in the same direction. If, uh, if gravity was like electromagnetism, where it would cancel between different particles, we would never know that gravity existed. So there's a, very likely there's a whole world of forces that we don't know about that are very weak and that um, it's very hard to see how we're going to discover them experimentally. But we may, through a combination of theory and experiment, we may get somewhere. I think one of the most exciting things to look for is the decay of the proton. Protons are absolutely stable, we think. I mean, they certainly live more than uh, 10 to the 30, what is it, 33 or 34 years. That's a one with that many zeros. Um, much, much longer than the age of the universe. Uh, experiments are underway to look for decays of protons. And um, that's, again, one of these very, very weak things that would arise from physics at an energy scale like 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 16 or higher uh, billion volts. Well, we'll see. I mean, there's, there's things to be done. Um, but it's going to be very hard. I've actually got a couple of points on mine. Uh, going back to the linear accelerator, uh, since the electrons are so much less massive than protons, you can generate more energy toward the collision. And do you expect the uh, electron collisions to be more clear on uh, illustrating the properties of the Higgs or any other particular particles that well, come out Well, the electrons, that. you know, they can have whatever energy you give them, but in fact, the design of the colliders that people are talking about would give them a lower energy than the protons in the Large Hadron Collider. But most of the energy in the Large Hadron Collider is wasted. Uh, only a tiny fraction goes into producing new particles like the Higgs particle. The electron and its antiparticle are elementary particles. When they collide, uh, you don't get this enormous shower of junk coming out. You get a few kinds of events, and uh, it's much more efficient, and you can do much more accurate experiments. But um, the energy is lower. The reason the energy has to be lower is you can't accelerate electrons the way you do protons by sending them round and round a ring, because they radiate uh, a kind of radiation called synchrotron radiation, and it, it becomes just energetically impossible to get them up to sufficiently high energy. Although it's sort of interesting that that synchrotron radiation was discovered by elementary particle physicists trying to accelerate electrons, and it is now used in a very practical way as a means of studying the properties of useful materials. That's an example of an unexpected spin-off of the sort I mentioned before, although you know, it's not why we do these things. I'm really running out of steam. Um, uh, maybe one more yeah. question here. Yeah, just, just one, yeah, more. Just one more, please. Yeah. All right. There are lots of students here today. I don't know if you can see. There are lots in the back and the dark. Um, and all of them are driven by the desire to understand the laws of nature. Uh, can you think back to when you were starting and say what skill or personality trait or what has helped you in scientific work and what advice, advice would you give students today? Pompous. Um, <laughs> I would say that I... I 
got hooked on theoretical physics in high school because I read popular books and I didn't really understand them very well. They were by serious scientists like James Jeans and George Gamow. And I remember seeing an equation in one of them, QP minus PQ is IH equals IH. Well, QP means Q times P. So how could Q times P minus P times Q be anything but zero? <laughs> and I thought about that a lot. And I, well, that was quantum mechanics. So that was something I had to learn. Um, I think, uh, you know, it, it was, it was clearly something which gave people power over nature. Not so much power to build things, but to understand. Uh, and of course, it was right after World War II, and uh, it really did give people power over nature in a very spectacular way. So all that was very entrancing to me. Uh, I don't have any particular advice uh, to give, except learn a lot of mathematics. Um, don't feel you have to understand everything to do research. That was a mistake I made for a long time. I, I had the good fortune as a first year graduate student to go to the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen with the idea of just reading books. And uh, I got kicked in the pants and told, you have to start doing research. And I said, well, you know, I can't do research. I don't know everything. And uh, well, I learned you don't have to know everything to start doing research. I guess that's the, and keep working. Um, most of the time when you're working, you're not getting anywhere. It's a very frustrating business. I imagine being a poet is like that. Um, most of the time, nothing really comes out. And every once in a while, it does. And that makes it all worthwhile. Um, and don't give up, but just keep, keep working at it. If, look, if all this advice is unnecessary, because if you love it, you're going to do it, and if you don't love it, you shouldn't. Let's thank uh, uh, Professor Weinberg again. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. You know, we have about 900 people in this, uh, in this room. I think, you know, this is actually the, the, the biggest crowd in this, in this year for any speakers. And, you know, I'm really impressed and happy to see that the physics talk brought this many people. Let's, let's give him another big applause. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Ooh.